Thank you all so much for joining me today. Again, my name is Olivia. I work at the James A. Garfield National Historic Site. And today we are going to be talking about the buildup and beginning of the Civil War. A coworker of mine is going to take over part two where you kind of talk about the ending and after effects of the Civil War. We are going to highlight some unique Civil War sites that the National Park Service preserves and kind of talk about how you can visit them and why they matter. So the National Park Service protects the land that tells our nation's stories. And a large part of our nation's story is the Civil War. Not only was it the bloodiest battle in our nation's history, but it also has lasting effects that we can continue to see today. The Civil War armchair tour of sites that we will talk about is not going to be all battles or prisons, but we're going to talk about kind of these unique stories of people and how they connect to the Civil War. This is really important to preserve because it's important that our future generations are able to learn from what happened in the Civil War. And you know, it would be really easy for them to flip through a textbook to learn about it, but that doesn't always convey the emotions and horror that took place before, during, and after the Civil War. So the National Park Service preserves these sites to encourage people to be lifelong learners and to continue to gain greater perspective. And here we can see a fog spreading over Gettysburg National Military Park, a very well-preserved site. And here in the background, we just see the beginning or the, the top of the Pennsylvania Monument. So to talk a little bit more about why should we should preserve Civil War sites, I have pulled an image, an aerial image of Ox Hill Mil Military Park in Fairfax, Virginia. This is not a national park site, but we have, you know, we kind of collaborate with other organizations to tell these joint stories. There have already been so many sites lost to development. This Ox Hill site, the battle was originally 500 acres, but today we have four acres remaining. And you know, there is so much development around it, it's hard to really place it unless we had that, that marker there. So here, if you are to visit the Ox Hill M Memorial Park, you can see a nice little memorial. But you will also see, you know, straight across the street, there's busy traffic, kind of hearing that rush of traffic, um, and also neighborhoods. So you learn, you lose a little bit of the context when you visit today. Another threat to Civil War sites is cell phone towers, believe it or not. So this may seem like something small, but again, it's just kind of thinking about the context for when you visit. So here we have a view of Chickamauga National Battlefield, and James Garfield himself actually fought in this battle. And you know, James Garfield did not see a cell phone tower, so it kind of goes to how we're losing a bit of that context or perspective. You know, a lot of you may visit these national sites to, to kind of step back in time, but situations like this can help pull you out a bit. So we have to think about what surrounds a place. You know, it's not simply about preserving the battlefield or preserving the site, but preserving a little bit of a buffer too, so that we have the full, the full context. The first stop on our armchair tour today is going to be Natchez National Historical Park. This is in Mississippi, kind of along the Mississippi River. And Natchez tells the history of Natchez, Mississippi over time. So it's kind of best known for the antebellum era mansions today, but this history actually dates back thousands of years. So the land was once part of a series of Native American villages. The French settlers called this area Natchez after the name of the native people. So that is how it got, the national park got its name today. Here you can also learn about European settlements, African enslavement, and the American cotton economy, and also the struggle of civil rights after the Civil War. This is a historical park, which is different from James A. Garfield National Historic Site. A historical park is usually a bit more sp spread out, so you may have to drive to visit the sites. But there are four stops on this site that we're going to talk about today. So we recommend that you start your visit to Natchez at the Visitor Center. Here you can pick up some information, maybe a map, talk to rangers about programs that they are offering. At the Visitor Center, they can offer you this map of a driving tour of Civil War sites. And along this stop, they have several sites that are publicly fever federally owned, but also lots that are privately owned. So they encourage you to make this driving tour, but just not to stop too long at the private sites to give the owners their privacy. But I thought this was really interesting because it speaks to the value of having these federally owned lands that the public can access for all. You know, think of how nice it would be if we were able to kind of stop at each of these sites and go in to take a better look around. The second stop on Natchez National Historic Park is William Johnson's house. William Johnson was, in bor was born an enslaved man in 1809. He became free at age 11, and after this he became a really successful entrepreneur. 
He actually owned a barber shop and was own, known as the Barber of Natchez. As a free black man, Johnson also owned 16 enslaved people, which may seem surprising for us today. In his diary, he writes openly about the enslaved people he owned and the difficult experiences that accompanied this. So here we get a look of Johnson's diary. Back then, it was not very common at all for enslaved people to learn how to read or write. So Johnson having this diary that chronologues 16 years of his life is very valuable for the National Park Service. And a lot of the interpretive programs that they deliver are based firsthand on Johnson's diary. So here we have a look into the visitor center. They have Johnson's diary on display for you to see. So here we have the Melrose Mansion, so kind of what Natchez is most well known for, that ant antebellum era mansions. So this was not a working plantation, but it was a suburban residence for a wealthy lawyer that lived in the area. Here he lived with his family and enslaved people that they owned. This house is extremely well preserved and gives a very unique insight into the southern economy that was built on cotton and enslaved people labor. The newest site of Natchez National Historic Park is Forks of the Road. So this was established in June of 2021 and here we get a nice picture of that happening. Forks of the Road marks the second largest domestic slave market in the Deep South during that antebellum period. Before the Civil War, tens of thousands of people were brought in chains and coffles from the Upper South to Natchez. And before this market itself was established, it was very common to see slave traders selling people on every different street corner you could see. But with fear of the cholera epidemic, they concentrated that into this one market, kind of forcing them outside of the city limits as well. Here, enslaved people were treated as property, this merchandise to be traded and sold. And these you know, inhumane transactions of people were lo very loosely documented. So they often split up families. There were some cases where um, these slave traders were actually selling their own children off, which is very, very scary to think about. And this obviously has had large impacts in our society even today. You know, a lot of people that come from enslaved people kind of trying to trace back their ancestry, it's very difficult for them to do this because these transactions were very loosely documented. So because of this, it's very important for the National Park Service to preserve this site to tell the story of these people. And it's, it's very awful to think about. You know, some people may say, well, we don't really want to remember this, but it's very important, important that because so much suffering took place here that we pay memorial to these people. And here we can, um, the National Park Service is also considering drawing some parallels to the human trafficking that is still occurring today. So, you know, we think of slavery as like a thing of the past, but human trafficking is still alive and happening today. Here we have a, di or a letter entry from a soldier in Wisconsin. So Forks of the Road operated as a slave market from 1832 to 1863. In the fall of 1863, members of the 12th Wisconsin Infantry and the newly created 58th United States Colored Troops actually tore down the slave pans to build barracks. Many of the men in the Colored Troops had been previously sold as slaves at this market. So a member of this Wisconsin unit recorded the enthusiasm of the men as they destroyed this area that previously enslaved them. And enthusiasm, when you think about it, is a bit of an odd word to use for this. But just think about how angry and upset these men would feel. Like this, this site tore their families apart, put them in these horrible situations. And so it's very empowering for them to kind of tear that down to the ground. Today, if we visit the site, we are unable to see any structures. So once it was torn down, it was kind of left that way. But, and the National Park Service does have some plans to erect um, a bit of a, a better memorial there. So here we have a view of Forks of the Road National or Forks of the Road site of Natchez National Historical Park. The National Park Service is currently working on some long-range interpretive plans, so to make the, these very powerful programs to explain the site. If you are to visit today, we have a lot of freestanding exhibits. A lot of the site is visible from your car, so if you're looking for a driving option, this is a good choice. But they're also um, pretty accessible as well, with lots of sidewalks to walk up to the exhibits. This site is all ex outside, so make sure to bring enough water and snacks for the day. You are also welcome to explore this site with your pet, which is nice, just as long as your pet is under direct control. And if you are to visit this site today, it's pretty peaceful, like this nice green space. 
but we encourage you to be reflective of how it was once the, the worst site for some people, and this was often just the beginning of even worse horrors to follow. The National Park Service pays tributes to the victims of our nation's past and ensures that our people will always remember them by preserving this, this horrible site. There has also been talks of creating a more formal memorial, like I said. Here we can see a small memorial that has been created so far. So as we talked about how the enslaved people were freed, they kind of have this, this broken chain and coffles on the ground at the site, which I think is pretty powerful. So it can be upsetting to learn about these very awful sites, as we said, but it also encourages our citizens today be, to be more thoughtful and empathetic learners. So kind of going back to why learn about the Civil War, it does have lasting effects today, and learning about these events encourages us to be more thoughtful citizens today. And it's also important to learn about what exactly people were fighting for in our bloodiest battle in our, in our history. So here we have another view of Forks of the Road site from an aerial perspective. I just want to see, can anyone kind of spot where Forks of the Road may be based on our site? It's kind of hard to see with lots of this development that occurred. Is it at the fork in the road? Yes, yeah, that is what I wanted to convey. So today it's like, it's very hard to see the site itself if we're just looking at it from this way, but it still does have that fork of the road that gave the site its name in the first place. So kind of this infamous fork of the road. So as you can imagine, it would be very easy to drive by this site without realizing the history of it due to the vast development that has occurred here. This site is on the same parcel of land as a church. So if you were just even driving by it, you may just think that it's just the backyard of a church. Here we have a street view. So to provide a little bit more context about that buffer zone that we were talking about, here we have the kind of the end and beginning of the Forks of the Road site on the left. And then directly across the street, there is actually a, a car body shop that is selling um, tinting windows, I guess. And this is obviously no fault to the, to the car dealership owner. Just kind of this land was developed over time and they took advantage of that. But this really shows how what surrounds us in a national park really matters. You know, if you're learning about what happened at Forks of the Road at Interpretive Exhibit, if you look directly across the street or a car kind of whizzes by, it may bring you out of that moment a bit. So we've learned a lot about the awful history of enslavement in our country, but now we are going to highlight an enslaved person that bravely made it to freedom and helped others to do the same. We are moving to Harriet Tubman National Historic Park. Harriet Tubman was born as an enslaved person in Maryland in 1822. Her parents named her Araminta, but she later changed her name to Harriet after her mother. <coughs> At age 13, she was nearly killed from a blow to the head. However, she quickly recovered and became even more determined to escape to freedom after this. Following her freedom, she dedicated her life to helping her family and friends. So it's estimated that she helped around 70 people escape to freedom. This gave her the title of Moses of her people. After escaping to freedom, Harriet Tubman kind of settled down in Auburn, New York. It was a popular hub for abolitionists at the time, so she had some, some friends and safety here. But she would actually return 13 times to Maryland, so kind of constantly putting this freedom at risk. Tubman realized that a civil war between the North and South was coming, so she really wanted to make sure that she was in New York in this safe position. Frances Seward, wife of Secretary of State at the time and a popular abolitionist, inherited some properties after the death of her father, and she actually sold this property that we see today to Harriet Tubman for a very low price. It had an old barn on the property that we'll see in a second. So here is the old barn, and Harriet Tubman actually opened up this barn for some housing for people on their way to freedom. So just a very, very inspiring person and wanting to really help others, dedicating her life. Some people that she housed in this barn included some orphans, people who were disabled, and anyone too old to work and support themselves. Here, another stop at Harriet Tubman National Historic Park features Harriet Tubman's AME Zion Church. She was a very religious woman. This was her church for the last 22 years of her life. And this picture is very interesting to me because it's actually believed to be taken around the time of Harriet Tubman's funeral. And here we have another example of a National Historic Park, so a little bit different than James A. Garfield. You have multiple different stops along the way. So 
there are many different sites within the National Park Service that dedicate themselves to teaching about Harriet Tubman. Another national park is Boston African American National Historic Site. This is in Massachusetts. And here you can learn a lot more about Harriet Tubman's 13 trips back to Maryland, or Boston, excuse me. During these first few visits, Tubman visited with leading abolitionists like John A. Andrew and Wendell Phillips. Later on, she spoke to large groups and raised funds for her cause. And rem if you remember when we talked about William Johnson, Harriet Tubman never actually learned how to read or write. So these speeches are even that much more inspiring. And she really helped inspire the movement, inspired people to join and continue on the fight. Here we have a view of Beacon Hill in Boston. There are a few houses along the way um, that are featured in this historical site. But this Beacon Hill really became a hub for abolitionists. Boston was one of the earliest cities to abolish slavery, making it a destination for many people to kind of travel to as they escaped via the Underground Railroad. A tight-knit free black community provided a sanctuary for those on their way to freedom. However, m unfortunately, over time, many slave catchers caught on with that this was like a hub for abolitionists helping people on their way to freedom, so they also flocked to this area. Here we have a very disheartening poster that was put on um, after the Fugitive Slave La Act of 1850. This was posted by abolitionists, kind of warning free black people that slave catchers may be coming to bring them back. Now we are going to highlight a very inspiring story to freedom that they were also impacted by this Fugitive Slave Act, but in a little bit of a different way. And you can learn a bit more about them at the Boston African American National Historic Site. So here we have a picture of Ellen Craft and William Craft. Ellen Craft was born Ellen Smith in 1826, and she was born in Clinton, Georgia. She was the daughter of a white slave owner and an enslaved mother. Her almost white appearance that was described by her husband, William Craft, led to a lot of people assuming that she was actually part of her father's family. And this really angered her mother because she was techni technically an enslaved person owned by them, so she did not want them to be viewed as part of the family. So the mother of the family actually gave Ellen to her daughter to kind of get her out of the house to stop these rumors. And this happened when Ellen was just 11 years old. Here she relocated to Macon, Georgia, where she met William Craft. And they quickly fell in love and made plans to get married. With their marriage, though, since they belonged to different people, they actually were not to live together. So this kind of inspired them to plot their journey to freedom. So, due to Ellen's rather fair complexion, William came up with the plan that she could disguise, her, disguise herself as a white slave owner, having him as her enslaved person. And here she would be able to lead both of them out of freedom. Ellen originally expressed a lot of hesitation. She was really scared about this idea and didn't really think that she would be able to pull off the disguise, but William just kept reassuring her that he thought it would really work. And over time, she eventually agreed. William started buying different pieces of clothing ar across town to create Ellen's disguise. And he did this very carefully because he did not want to raise suspicion with him buying this completely new wardrobe. And it was a slightly different size than his, so he didn't want to raise suspicion. They decided that Ellen would portray a very sick white planter, so they would have her arm in a sling. And this was because, if you remember, a lot of enslaved people did not learn how to read or write, so Ellen did not know how to read or write. So if she was asked to actually sign her name, she would be unable to. So having her arm in a sling, she could ask other people to sign her name for her. They, the handkerchief is not up here, but they would also have the handkerchief kind of pulled up over her mouth um, to fake a toothache that the man had. And this was to hide her beardless face, so to not raise suspicion about this either. She also faked a limp and used a cane or some spectacles to fake poor sight and pretended to be hard of hearing to avoid conversations with others. And their, their plan that they had was that Ellen, disguised as a man, would be traveling north to get some care, bringing her enslaved man with her. So the crafts had many close calls on this voyage to freedom, but luckily they were able to escape to the north. In 1850, with the fugitive sl slave law threatening their freedom, they fled to England, where they settled down safely for the next 20 years. And I will not get too much in this just for the sake of time, 
but the National Park Service on the Boston African American National Historic Site website has this very interesting interactive map that kind of takes you through each stop along the craft's journey to freedom. And it's just a very useful education tool, so I encourage you all to check this out. So we have talked a lot about the buildup beginning of what caused the war, but now we're going to get into the actual start of the war. So he, to learn more about this, you can head to Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie National Historic Park. On April 12, 1861, at 4.30 in the morning, the rising tension between the South and North over the issue of slavery really erupted here. The Confederacy bombarded Fort Sumter. From Fort Johnson, a gunner in Captain George S. James's mortar battery fired on Fort Sumter, and within half an hour, every Confederate battery in the harbor that could reach Fort Sumter was here to take it over. On the second day of this bombardment of Fort Sumter, a Confederate troop from, from Fort Moultrie close by set the fort into flames. The fire began on the roof line of the officers' quarters on the gorge wall and just really took over the whole building. So here we have final blow delivered to Fort Sumter pictured. This picture shows us Fort Sumter on April 15, 1861, after the evacuation of Union forces. During the summer of 1863, federal forces gained control of Morris Island and began their own bombardment of Charleston and Fort Sumter. This effort from the Union Army reduced the fort we see in the picture to ruins, so it was basically leveled out. Confederate soldiers and enslaved laborers worked to dig bomb proofs, which only further transformed the landscape to be kind of unrecognizable. This siege of Charleston continued until February 17, 1865, which was the long longest siege in U.S. military history. During this time, at least 52 Confederates and an unknown number of enslaved African Americans were killed. Today, you can take a boat tour out to visit Fort Sumter and step into the beginning of the Civil War, so kind of stepping into the shoes of the battle that we just talked about. Here we have a very nice sea view of Fort Sumter, so if you, I think it's very nice that you're able to take a boat out there. Fort Moultrie is a very unique site to visit because it documents over 200 years of seacoast defense, and this spans from the American Revolution to World War II, actually. So we talked about how the Confederates delivered the final blow to Fort Sumter from Fort Moultrie, but it also um, is a place to learn about, you know, United States history and people, broader than the Civil War. One of those interesting people connected to Fort Moultrie is actually Edgar Allan Poe, Poe's story, The Gold Bug, actually takes place on Sullivan's Island. So as you drive into the site, you actually see a lot of these Poe-themed attractions. That is mainly why. But Poe also enrolled in the University of Virginia in 1826. He dropped out the same year, and then after this, he actually enlisted in the Army. And he enlisted under the name of Edgar A. Perry, and he was assigned to Fort Moultrie. So if you visit Fort Moultrie today, you can see basically um, just the beginning structure of the building that Poe lived in. Next, we are going to talk a little bit more about more battles that took place in the Civil War. So Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park is a very interesting site in my opinion. It has about 3,000 acres preserved of battlefield. And here what took place is opposing forces maneuvered and fought here from June 19, 1864 until July 2, 1864. When you visit here today, you can actually take about 22 miles of trails to kind of hike as you learn. We recommend that you pick, stop by the vi visitor center first to pick up a brochure to kind of talk with rangers, check in about what's going on at the park. There, they also have an orientation film and a museum for you to view, so similar to James A. Garfield site. From there, you can take a driving tour to the, fo to the four stops of the park to learn more about the battles that took place here. So here we have a look of the driving option that you can take throughout the house. And this is actually the original sign, entry sign for the park, which is very interesting. So I really love learning about more about this site because it's like a lot of history that you can learn here, but it also has a nice natural aspect as well. You are also able to reach the summit of Big Kennesaw Mountain. Some very pretty sunset views there. And here is an example of those trails that I was talking about. So along the way, on the trails, there are different stops for interp interpretation opportunities. So you really are like stepping back in time, experiencing what the soldiers would with this natural landscape. Here you can also see the Illinois Monument that memorializes the Union soldiers lost during this battle. 
This monument was dedicated on June 27, 1914, with the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. Now we are going to learn a bit more about what being an injured soldier was like in this war and who dedicated her life to taking care of these men. So to learn more about this, we are heading to Clara Barton National Historic Site. This is in Maryland. And Clara Barton really dedicated her life to helping others. There are many different NPS sites that talk a bit about her, but we're going to talk about her home in Glen Echo, which she called home for the last 15 years of her life. So the Clara Barton National Historic Site tells the story of Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross. Barton saw the inadequate medical treatment that was happening during the Civil War and set out to provide care. So she was really on the battlefield with these soldiers, helping to provide better care for them. Here we have an overhead view of this site. The Clara Barton National Historic Site is actually closed for some construction that's taking place right now. And as we saw in the last picture, they're kind of right along that river. So they're also looking at the opportunity to open it up for some outdoor recreation opportunities, environmental education, which really shows how the National Park Service is dedicated to serving its people in every way possible. So although the house is currently closed, you are welcome to explore the grounds. They are very beautiful. And this, the Clear Barton site being closed also provides a very important lesson on best practices for visiting national parks. So we always recommend that you check the website to see any alerts that they have issued, but it's also good to call the site ahead to just check in as well. So we expect some really great programming to take place in the future. Here we have a view of the Red Cross Hotel that served as a hospital for injur injured soldiers during the Civil War. She, Clara Barton helped many injured soldiers during the Civil War, and she also set up a system for finding missing soldiers, and this was the first of its kind back then. So as we mentioned earlier, the National Park Service really highlights a lot of sites dedicated to Clara Barton. If you find yourself in Antietam National Battlefield, you will also see the Clara Barton Monument. And this kind of specifically highlights the, the true dedication she had to helping these injured soldiers. So one story that I found in some of my research was that Clara Barton was, during the Battle of Antietam, was going to give an injured soldier some water and right as she was about to lean down, she felt a bullet whiz through her sleeve. And when she looked back down, she found out that the bullet had actually killed this man that she was about to give water. So it's just so empowering to see how she, you know, she was in the battlefield with these men, but still wanted to help and risk her life. At the base of this monument, we can see the red cross in symbol of Clara Barton to recognize her strength and determination. After this battle took place, Barton actually collapsed in exhaustion and she became very sick, but that did not make her give up. So she returned to Washington to regain her strength. And then once she felt better, she came back to the battlefields to continue her work. So just a very amazing woman. James A. Garfield actually has a connection to Clara Barton. So she was helping soldiers throughout the war, as we talked about, but the American Red Cross was officially founded about 20 years later. She had been lobbying the American government for years to have them officially recognize the American Red Cross and to have the American Red Cross join the International Red Cross. President Garfield was very supportive of this, but he unfortunately passed away before he could sign the treaty. Before he did die, though, in May of 1881, he nominated Clara Barton to serve as the first president of the American Red Cross. So now we are going to move to a site that has another connection to Mentor's own James A. Garfield. And that is Camp Chase Confederate Cemetery in Columbus. So this is actually not a national park, but it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, which also helps us to tell our nation's stories. So the National Park Service will often keep an eye on this National Register of Historic Places to look for sites that should be elevated to National Park Service status. So kind of looking for some gaps in our nation's stories and where we can highlight that. This site is less than six miles outside of downtown Columbus. So again, going back to like that idea of preservation, it's actually between these two really busy streets. So it's very, very cool to just step into the past there. This site originally began as a training facility in 1861 to prepare Ohioans for the Civil War. And it was, as we may have seen with my little clicker error, James A. Garfield was actually one of those Ohioans that was stationed to train here. 
We'll be talking a bit more about Garfield's involvement in the Civil War in the second session as we explore the remaining years of the war and the after effects. So I encourage you to head to that session as well to learn more about his involvement. So this site began as this Union training camp, but shortly after opening, they received their first prisoner of war. And about five months later, there were nearly 300 prisoners at the site. By 1864, the population continued to explode, and we had nearly 8,000 prisoners of war here. So this site was not equipped to handle this much population, so it led to some unsanitary conditions, disease, malnutrition, and exposure. The military initially interred the dead in Columbus's city cemetery, but in 1863, it established a cemetery at the camp's location. By the end of the camp's closure in July 1865, more than 26,000 Confederate soldiers had been held here in total. So to talk a little bit more about how this site became preserved, it was actually a former Union soldier himself that kind of stepped in, saw the site in disrepair, and decided to memorialize the dead here a little bit better. His name was William Noss. He found the cemetery in a state of disrepair, as we said, and set out to clean it. At this time, a large boulder was placed in the center of the grounds with the inscription, 2,260 Confederate soldiers of the war, 1861 to 1865, buried in this enclosure. So that is written on the rock that we see there. Noss held the first Memorial Day service at the Camp Chase Confederate Cemetery in 1895. These Memorial Day events continued into, under Noss's leadership and the Camp Chase Memorial Associ Association was found, founded in 1899 to solicit funds for de decorating graves and erecting a monument of the soldiers that we can see above that original boulder. So although this is not a National Park Service site, it gives a very nice perspective for other people and organizations working to preserve these, these Civil War sites to share our history. So Camp Chase Confederate Cemetery was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. And this is a very, it's not an overbearing process, but we can see just an example of the documents that they submitted, the photograph to prove its historical significance. So that visitors, when they look at this list, they know that it's truly historically significant. All right, so now to talk a little bit more about how you can actually visit these sites. The National Park Service is really great with either selling or issuing um, different annual or lifelong passes that allow you free admission into any national park. So if you kind of want to go on a Civil War tour of these sites, you are able to get a pass and kind of save some money on that. James A. Garfield National Historic Site is only able to issue this bottom row of passes. If you are looking for the annual pass or the senior annual pass, you can either purchase that at your first fee site that you visit, so any site that, um, that requires a fee can also issue those passes, um, but you are also able to purchase them online. We have these sites preserved for our public to experience for themselves, so it's just really great that there are opportunities like this to easily see them all. Now I have a list of my sources. If any of these sites really caught your attention, I would be happy to provide you a list of them. Um, just make sure that to give me your email and then we can get that out to you. But again, I want to thank you all for your time. I really enjoyed doing the research for these Civil War sites and presenting them to you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all.